Hello and welcome back to my channel. This video will cover everything you need to know on cybersecurity for beginners. I'm also using a new mic today, so let me know what you guys think of the audio. But first things first, what is cybersecurity? Cybersecurity is the practice of protecting digital systems and information from unauthorized access, use, disclosure, and disruption. It covers a wide range of topics such as network security, application security, data security, and user security. This also happens to be one of the most searched topics that you guys have searched for, so hopefully this is helpful to you. So whether you're just starting out looking at entry-level roles in cybersecurity, security or you already know that you want to go into the red team or the offensive security team versus the blue team defensive security team one of the most important things to know is the cia triad which is essentially the three pillars of cybersecurity. so this includes confidentiality integrity and availability so when you talk about cybersecurity controls in an organization they are typically going to fall back into one of these three things and confidentiality is exactly what it sounds like keeping any sensitive or private information in the hands of those that actually need to access it basically making sure that private information stays private and this will go back into access access controls, user management, VPNs, firewalls, etc. Integrity is making sure that the data is untampered with and ensuring that the data is trustworthy, knowing that only those with access to edit, update, or delete that data were the only ones who made any changes to that data. And then of course, availability, which a lot of people don't really consider, which you may not always think about as something related to cybersecurity. But when you think availability, one thing that you may think about is DDoS attacks or distributed denial of service attacks, which is essentially when an attacker makes so many requests to an endpoint or an application or a database that it crashes and is no longer able to fulfill any other requests from other legitimate users. And because of this, it can take down whole systems, whole websites, whole applications. And that is why availability is so important in cybersecurity. In fact, many companies will pay a lot of money to keep their applications running all the time. Obviously, if you think of big sites like Google, they're paying millions, billions of dollars every single year to make sure that their applications are always running alive when users want to access them. They probably have multiple sets of backups and disaster recovery and business continuity plans so that they don't go down. The next thing you may want to consider learning a little bit more about are common cybersecurity threats, including malware, phishing attacks, ransomware, and social engineering attacks. So there are lots of different types of malware, including worms, Trojan horses, backdoors, rootkits, but essentially all malware is is some kind of application that runs to perform some kind of task on its host that isn't intended by the real user. One example could be spyware, where maybe you open and downloaded a suspicious file from an email that you got, and you weren't aware of the security concerns behind something like that because you hadn't watched this video yet, but that could have downloaded some kind of spyware onto your device, for example, like a keylogger, which tracks all of the keystrokes that you type in into your keyboard and is able to send them to the hacker or the attacker's personal device somewhere so that they have access to maybe some passwords that you typed in or some sensitive information about yourself. So for those of you who are looking to get started in a career in cybersecurity, I'd recommend checking out the Simply Learn Postgraduate Program in Cybersecurity. The Simply Learn Postgraduate Program in Cybersecurity is one of the world's top cybersecurity programs with an average of 100 plus enrollments in every batch. Simply Learn has built a program in collaboration with MIT Schwarzman College of Computer and EC Council. This postgraduate program in cybersecurity is designed to equip you with the skills required to become an expert in the rapidly growing field of cybersecurity, and the program duration is for six months. It was also chosen as the best cybersecurity program in 2022 by Course Report. And I think one of the most important things to call out here is cybersecurity industry trends. Based on cyber ventures, by 2026, there will be 3.5 million unfilled cybersecurity jobs internationally with 700,000 available job roles today and the average annual salary of about $100,000 per year. This is also one of the reasons why I think cybersecurity is such a good career to go into, especially because joining a program like this will be able to help you kickstart your career in just a few months, where you can come in as a complete beginner and leave with a completed certification with a real hands-on experience, learning foundational cybersecurity concepts, working on hands-on projects, and have a much higher learning potential than most roles in and outside of tech as an entry-level beginner. They also have various different learner reviews listed on their platform with roles in security architecture and tech consulting. There's no prior experience required to enroll in this course and any graduate can enroll in this program. The program leverages MIT's academic excellence in cybersecurity and provides a comprehensive understanding of the field with various different courses featuring modules from the MIT Schwarzman College of Computing and EC Council, as well as master classes from MIT faculty. You'll have a chance to work on 25 hands-on projects, as well as have access to modules from EC Council and have access to CEH learning material. The top alumni from Simply Learn's postgraduate program in cybersecurity include Google, Amazon, Microsoft, IBM, LinkedIn, JP Morgan. At the end of this program, you'll also receive receive an EC Council learning kit and exam voucher, as well as six months free access to CHI Labs, plus 25 hacking challenges from the EC Council that'll give you really good experience as someone who is just getting started in cybersecurity. Skills covered include ethical hacking, risk management, advanced hacking concepts, as well as mobile and web technologies. You can check out their admissions process where you can pay via monthly installments with various payment options with low APR and no hidden fees for as low as $264 a month. 
You can fill in your details to learn more about the program and speak directly with one of their career counselors to learn more about their admissions process and the program itself. So if you guys are interested in checking out the Simply Learn postgraduate program in cybersecurity, you can use my code Sandra10 for 10% off. You can also learn more about the program itself linked in my description below. Thank you to Simply Learn for sponsoring today's video and let's get back to the rest of the topics. Phishing, I think, is one that has popped up a lot these days and that is when, and that of course ties back to our previous example of if someone sends you an email that may be suspicious, want you to click some kind of link, enter your information, download a suspicious file. Usually when it comes to phishing attacks, you should follow the rule of thumb where if it sounds too good to be true, then it probably is. If someone is offering, they send you $100,000 in Bitcoin and they want some information from you. I know it probably sounds very alluring, but if it sounds too good to be true, then it probably is. There are also various different flavors of phishing, including vishing, which is voice phishing, when someone calls you and tries to scam information from you, or smishing, where they send you a text message also looking to get some kind of information from you or trying to get you to send some kind of money, whether it's through gift cards or Zelle or Bitcoin. Ransomware is a very interesting one. In fact, when I used to work at a computer store when I was in college, there's so many people who came by to get their laptop wiped and completely reset because they fell for some kind of scam that led them to download some kind of applications that they thought was legitimate but ended up being ransomware that will essentially encrypt all of your data so you're not able to access it and it gives you three days or some kind of time limit to give you that sense of urgency to give them $500 in Bitcoin to this address and if you don't do it then they'll delete all of your files or they'll send it out to people in your email contact list or something. Random things like that. Ransomware I do think is very tricky because obviously if you are an individual and you get locked out of your device versus if you are an organization and an employees get locked out of multiple assets and devices, that is definitely a very different story in terms of the scale and scope of that ransomware. But these are all good topics to know when you're going into cybersecurity, especially when you're looking for entry-level roles, you'll probably get some kind of interview question that'll cover topics like this, whether it's just asking how familiar you are with the topic or if you've had any experience with it in one of these types of scenarios. Next up is network security. Networking definitely isn't my forte, but at a broad level, if you're going into a sysadmin role or a role that is closer to that implementation into the IT slash implementation side of things, you'll probably get a lot more hands-on with networking tools, including VPNs, firewalls, routers, as well as of course, encryption for data in transit. This will look really different depending on whether or not your company is remote, fully in person or hybrid. And I think in the past few years with so many companies going remote or hybrid, there's definitely been a change to how companies manage their virtual networks that allow employees to work from home or work from different places or work from places outside of the office. I do think that even going into an IT role would be a lot more beneficial to get hands-on experience with network security compared to a cyber security role, but I'm sure there are also cyber security roles that are very niche, that are very deep in the weeds in networking, especially for example, if you're considering something like your company's data center versus a public cloud, a lot of the setup for what that network is going to look like is also going to come back to the cyber security team who may provide some kind of input or insight into how that network is set up. But I do think that goes into the cloud security side of things. So if that's something you're interested in, I do think that is a very hot area to go into right now. Next up is web application security. So this is definitely one of my favorite areas in cyber security, specifically because I was previously a software developer in my past life before I got into cybersecurity. And a lot of this is really just understanding the common vulnerabilities, for example, the OWASP top 10, how to keep applications secure, as well as all things secure coding, whether you're doing code scanning or application scanning, even going into areas like pen testing and red teaming. All these things are assessments that companies will do to make sure that their applications are secure because nowadays most companies probably have some kind of online presence and they have some kind of application that connects to the internet for users to interact with. And while you probably don't expect every user to abuse your application, Application, there are definitely going to be some bad actors that are trying to take advantage of any common vulnerabilities that they can find on your site. So this is an area that I think a lot of companies are putting a lot of emphasis and budget into when it comes to making sure that their applications have annual pen tests, ensuring that any findings from those assessments are remediated in a timely manner according to your company's vulnerability management procedure. And of course, ensuring that developers are trained on the OWASP top 10 common vulnerabilities so that they're being proactive in not writing new code that may introduce some new vulnerabilities to your applications. Next up is data backup and recovery. So if something did go catastrophically wrong in your, for example, let's say a data center burns down and your company only had that one set of data in that data center. Obviously this probably isn't happening in real life, hopefully, but if that did happen, then you basically would have none of your data left, none of your servers, none of your databases. And that is why companies always have some kind of backup and recovery plan when something goes horribly wrong, when the internet goes down for a long period of time, uh, natural disasters, global pandemic, a lot of different things can go wrong. And having a good backup strategy is one of the most important things to keep your company's lights on when something bad goes wrong. Typically, there's going to be some kind of failover. If one data center goes down, then maybe there's a backup data center. Obviously, this can cost a good amount of money when it comes to backups and recovery, including the amount of time that it takes to bring 
bring it back up. For example, if you do have a backup data center, then it could be anything from a cold site to a warm site or a hot site. And this essentially just goes into how long it'll take to get that data center up and running. For example, whereas in one scenario, that backup data center may already have the servers and everything set up. And at the snap of your finger, obviously a little bit more work than that, you'll be able to be up and running again. But you may also be in a scenario where maybe none of the servers in the data center are set up yet, or maybe they're not updated yet. Maybe they're not patched regularly. And that is when it takes more time to get back up. But whatever it is, there should be some kind of plan or strategy that your company has when something catastrophic does go wrong. And that is why you should always back up your data, even if you're not backing it up on a real-time basis, which will definitely get very expensive. Maybe instead you can back it up on a daily basis or a weekly basis. And at least you'll have some kind of information to work off of if something horrible is wrong and you have to roll back the systems or you have to work completely out of, of the backup data center. Obviously this will look very different for cloud infrastructures, which is another reason why more companies are switching over to cloud infrastructures because it's cheaper than maintaining your own databases, than maintaining your own data centers and having your own data center backup. Just the cost of that upkeep is probably going to be a lot more expensive than going on the cloud, depending on the size of your company, of course, as well as all the security controls and compliance requirements that your company may have to follow. For example, if you have very sensitive health data or government data, uh, financial data, these are, I think, the three areas that have the most sensitive data of all. And you probably aren't just going to nonchalantly sign up for a public cloud infrastructure. You may even build your own private cloud or do some kind of hybrid situation. So lots of different options when it comes to the cloud. But of course, that'll also completely impact your data backups and recovery plan. And last but not least, I wanted to cover incident response. So what happens when something actually does happen? Your company typically will have some kind of incident response procedure or plan that gives you some kind of documented way to make sure that the correct steps are being followed so that every incident is handled in the same way, or at least following the same steps. This includes things like creating some kind of incident in whatever application that your company has, opening a bridge line and getting the right stakeholders on the line to be able to remediate the issue, making sure that it's quarantined so that it doesn't spread to the rest of the network, ensuring that you're alerting and communicating with the right stakeholders. For example, you may have an SLA for a customer to let them know about certain security incidents that may involve their information or their data or their users. And of course, finally closing out the incident and documenting everything in a retrospective or lessons learned so that you're able to carry those into the next incident that you have. And there are also different levels of incidents. For example, a priority one incident versus a priority five versus a priority four incident. One of them may need all hands on deck versus the other one that may be a little less urgent. A lot of companies will also do tabletop exercises to basically go through a simulated security breach or a security incident so that the entire cybersecurity team and all the stakeholders that may need to get involved are able to actually work together on this assessment or activity so that they can understand step-by-step step what they need to do as well as of course get more experience because incidents may not happen every single day and getting that hands-on experience using some kind of example exercise like this is a way for companies to be able to train their security staff on how to handle incidents when they come up. So I think we've covered most of the topics that I think are most relevant to entry-level cybersecurity roles, whether you're looking to be an SOC analyst, security analyst, a junior pen tester. Hopefully this video was able to help you take away some information that was new to you. And if you haven't already, I highly recommend studying for the CompTIA Security Plus. Personally, I did not come from a cybersecurity background. I came from a development background and I took my Security Plus when I was about a year into my role in cybersecurity. I was in a rotational program out of college and in studying for my Security Plus certification, I covered almost all these topics in this video and more. And I really think that gave me the foundation that I needed to really kick off my cybersecurity career. And if you're a beginner looking to switch into cybersecurity, maybe you're a college student, maybe you're a bootcamp student, definitely study for the CompTIA Security Plus or any equivalent cybersecurity entry-level certification. Though I do think the Security Plus is a very popular one. Another one that I recommend is a Google cybersecurity certification. And I do have a link for that down in my description if you guys want to check that out, which is created by Google and hosted on Coursera. Thank you guys so, so much for watching and hopefully this was helpful to you. Let me know if you guys have any questions in the comments below, as well as any other topics that you may want to add to this video, feel free to drop those down below as well. I post videos every Wednesdays and Sundays at 12 p.m. And hopefully I'll see you guys in my next video. Bye.